The Visigoths were a Germanic tribe that played a significant role in the history of Europe during the late Roman and early medieval periods. Emerging as one of the main groups within the broader Germanic migrations, the Visigoths first rose to prominence in the 4th century AD. Originally residing in the regions north of the Danube, they gradually migrated westward and established a kingdom that encompassed parts of modern-day France, Spain, and as far as Portugal. Widely known for their military prowess and cultural contributions, the Visigoths left a lasting impact on the political, social, and legal landscape of Europe. Despite their eventual defeat and displacement by the Muslim conquest of Spain in the 8th century, the legacy of the Visigoths continues to be studied and appreciated to this very day. Hello everyone and welcome. If you're new to the channel, it's good to meet you. If you're coming back, welcome back for another video. If you'd like to support the channel, you perhaps would like to follow the links to the Patreon. Otherwise, if you feel inclined to like, comment and subscribe, that certainly helps us out. Now, without further ado, let's start our video for today. A History of the Visigoths Well, let's go straight back to the beginning first. The Visigoths, originating from Gothic tribes, likely derive their name from the Gutones, a group believed to have originated in Scandinavia before migrating southeastward into Eastern Europe. However, the true origins of the Visigoths, like those of other Germanic tribes such as the Franks and the Alemanni, remain very obscure and are still subject to a lot of historical speculation. The Visigoths spoke an Eastern Germanic language that had become distinct by the 4th century. Although the Gothic language eventually faded away due to interactions with other European peoples during the Middle Ages, the Visigoths' early history was marked by conflicts with neighboring tribes, such as the Vandili and Lugi. These struggles may have contributed to their migration into mainland Europe. Initially, the Visigoths settled between the Oder and Vistula rivers. But according to Gothic legends or tribal sagas, overpopulation forced them to move south and east, eventually settling them north of the Black Sea. However, the validity of this legend is disputed due to lack of archaeological evidence. While a large-scale migration is possible, the movement of Gothic people southeastward was likely driven by warrior bands seeking access to the wealth of Ukraine and the cities along the Black Sea coast. Either way, by the middle of the 3rd century AD, the Visigoths had become a formidable military power beyond the lower Danube frontier, marking them as a significant force in the region. During the 3rd and 4th centuries, the Goths engaged in numerous conflicts and interactions with their neighbours, leading to significant upheaval and chaos in the region. Following the Roman withdrawal from the territory of Dacia, the local population faced constant invasions by migrating tribes, among the first being the Goths. Now, at this time, the Goths were just one group. They hadn't divided yet into the Visigoths and the Ostrogoths. That will come a little later. But of course, to understand the Visigoths, we should briefly talk about the Goths before them. Now, in 238, the Goths crossed the Danube into the Roman province of Moesia, 
launching raids and demanding payment through hostage-taking. Additionally, during the Roman-Persian Wars of that year, Goths were also enlisted in the Roman armies of Gordian III. When subsidies to the Goths ceased, they organized themselves, and, in the year 250, joined a major barbarian invasion led by the Germanic King Kniva. Achieving success on the battlefield against the Romans, the Goths expanded their incursions into the northern Balkans and Anatolia. Around 255, they began raiding coastal areas, bringing them into conflict with the Greeks. The fall of the city of Piteus to the Goths in 256 further emboldened them. Between 266 and 267, the Goths began raiding Greece, attempting to move into the Bosphorus Straits to attack Byzantium, but they were repelled. Alongside the other Germanic tribes, they ventured further into Anatolia, attacking Crete and Cyprus before pillaging Troy and the Temple of Artemis at Ephesus. That was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, by the way. So you can see how this was kind of a big deal. Well, despite efforts to stabilize relations through treaties, such as one reached by Emperor Constantine the Great in 332, the conflict between the Goths and the Romans only continued to persist, signifying the ongoing tensions in the region. The Goths remained in Dacia until 376, when their leader, Fritigern, appealed to the Eastern Roman Emperor Valens for permission to settle with his people on the southern bank of the Danube, seeking refuge from the Huns. Valens decided to allow this settlement, seeing the Goths as potential recruits for his army. However, a famine struck, and Rome failed to provide the promised food and land to the Goths. It didn't help that the Romans also mistreated the starving Goths, even forcing them to trade away their children into slavery to survive. This obviously ruffled a few feathers. The Goths felt like they had received a bit of a raw deal. Naturally, it led to open revolt and six years of plundering throughout the Balkans resulting in the death of a Roman emperor and the disastrous defeat of the Roman army. The Battle of Adrianople in 378 marked a turning point for the war. The Roman forces suffered heavy losses, embarrassingly heavy. And remember Emperor Valens? Well, he ended up getting killed on that very battlefield. The Goths got him and did him in, right there and then. Certainly not a morale boost for the Roman army. Now the exact circumstances of Valen's death remain somewhat uncertain. There's plenty of rumors and speculations but according to one Gothic legend, he was burned alive in a farmhouse, symbolizing the punishment of a heretical emperor. The defeat at Adrianople was huge. It dealt a severe blow to Roman prestige and military capabilities forcing the Romans to negotiate with and settle the Goths within the empire's boundaries. This event had far-reaching consequences for the eventual fall of Rome, and it is significant enough that 4th century Roman soldier and historian Ammianus Marcellinus ended 
his chronology of Roman history with this very battle. In fact, upon hearing of this battle, which the news was no doubt spread far and wide, people began to get the idea that Rome was weak enough to be conquered. The hunter had become the hunted. Well, it was already bad enough for Rome, but don't worry, it'll get much worse. The 5th century was not a fun time, at least for them. After the Battle of Adrianople, the Visigoths' gains were, however, short-lived. Confined to a small and relatively impoverished province of the empire, they faced renewed aggression from another Roman army gathering against them, which included disaffected Goths amongst its ranks. Intense campaigns against the Visigoths followed for upwards of three long years, during which approach routes across the Danube provinces were sealed off by concerted Roman efforts. While there was no decisive victory to claim, the Romans essentially triumphed, little by little. It was more of a culmination of small victories. And all of this led to a treaty in 382. This treaty, known as the Foedus, was significant as it was the first such agreement on imperial Roman soil. It required the semi-autonomous Germanic tribes, which included the Visigoths, to raise troops for the Roman army in exchange for arable land, good land, by the way, and freedom from Roman legal structures within the empire. However, that wasn't really good enough, because despite this agreement, the Visigoths eventually sacked Rome on August the 24th, 410 AD. After Theodosius I made peace with the rebels, stability persisted until his death in 395. However, in that year, Alaric I, the formidable sacker that we're about to talk about, the most famous king of the Visigoths, made a bid for the throne amid controversy and intrigue between the East and West factions, particularly involving General Stilicho's attempts to maintain his position in the empire. Theodosius was succeeded by his incompetent sons, Arcadius in the East and Honorius in the West. In 397, Alaric was appointed military commander of the eastern Illyrian prefecture by Arcadius. For the next 15 years, a rather uneasy peace was occasionally disrupted by conflict between Alaric and the powerful Germanic generals commanding the Roman armies in the east and west. Eventually, though, after Stilicho's execution by Honorius in 408 and the massacre of thousands of barbarian soldiers' families who were trying to integrate into the Roman Empire, well, the Visigoths had had enough, and Alaric decided to march on Rome. Despite initial setbacks in northern Italy, and a negotiated payoff ending a siege of Rome, Alaric's troops entered the city through the Salarian Gate on August the 24th, 410, and sacked it. Now, the situation behind this entire event is very complex, and it requires a video of its own. And I will get to it. Mm, probably over the next couple of days. Well, back to the Visigoths. 
Although Rome remained the official capital, it was no longer the de facto seat of the government of the Western Roman Empire. From the late 370s until 402, Milan had actually served as the government seat. However, after the siege of Milan, the imperial court moved to Ravenna in 402. Honorius frequently visited Rome, and after his death in 423, emperors mostly resided there. Now, Rome's fall, if we can call it that, perhaps not a complete collapse, but certainly a fall from grace, severely shook the empire's confidence, particularly in the West. Laden with plunder, Alaric and his Visigoths sought to leave Italy for northern Africa from Basilicata. However, Alaric had died before the disembarkation and was buried near the ruins of Croton, succeeded by his wife's brother. The Visigothic kingdom emerged as a significant power in the Western Europe during the 5th to the 8th centuries. Initially it was established in Gaul after the decline of Roman control over the western half of the empire, and later in Hispania until 711. For a brief period, the Visigoths held the strongest kingdom in western Europe. In response to the invasion of Roman Hispania in 409 by the Vandals, Alans, and Suebi, Emperor Honorius enlisted the aid of the Visigoths to retain control of the territory. From 408 to 410, the Visigoths inflicted significant damage on Rome and its surrounding areas, to the extent that, nearly a decade later, the provinces in and around the city could only contribute one-seventh of their previous tax shares. Now, in 418, Honorius had rewarded the Visigoths for their assistance by granting them land in Gallia Aquitania. Following their attack on the Vandals, Alans and Suebis who'd crossed the Rhine near Morganticum, well, this settlement formed the foundation of the future Visigothic kingdom, which would expand across the Pyrenees and all the way into the Iberian Peninsula itself. The Visigothic settlement played a crucial role in Europe's future, as it was their warriors who fought alongside Roman troops under General Flavius Aetius, preventing Attila the Hun from seizing control of Gaul and allowing the Romans to retain dominance. Under the rule of Euric, the Visigoths experienced a period of consolidation and some expansion. Euric successfully unified the various factions among the Visigoths and concluded a peace treaty with Emperor Julius Nepos in 475, solidifying the Visigothic kingdom's autonomy. Euric's territorial gains included most of southern Gaul between 471 and 476, making him one of the most powerful Visigothic kings. Some modern observers consider Euric to be the greatest of the Visigothic kings, even more than Alaric. Now, this is mainly due to his territorial acquisitions and his adoption of more modern Roman administrative and bureaucratic governance techniques. Euric's son, Alaric II, continued his father's policies, further consolidating Visigothic control over the Iberian Peninsula,
by subduing the Alans and pushing the Vandals back into North Africa. By the year 500, the Visigothic kingdom centered at Toulouse controlled Aquitania, Gallia Narbonensis, and the majority of Hispania, solidifying their dominance in Western Europe. However, in 507, the Franks under Clovis I defeated the Visigoths in the Battle of Voilay, leading to the death of King Alaric II and the tragic loss of Aquitaine. Well, despite this setback, Visigothic power in Gaul was not entirely lost. Thanks to the support of Theodoric the Great, the powerful Ostrogothic king in Italy. Theodoric's forces helped push Clovis I and his armies out of Visigothic territories. As part of his broader plan to extend his power across Spain and its associated lands. After the death of Alaric II, Visigothic nobles protected his heir, the child king Amalric, and relocated him to first to Narbonne and then into Hispania, with the great center of Visigothic rule then shifting to Barcelona and later to Toledo. From 511 to 526, Theodoric the Great of the Ostrogoths ruled as the de jure regent for the young Amalric. However, Theodoric's death in 526 allowed the Visigoths to restore their royal line through Amalric, who ruled independently for around five years. Well, five years. It should have been a little bit longer. Unfortunately, he was assassinated. Now, following Amaric's assassination in 531, another Ostrogothic ruler, Theudis, ascended to the Visigothic throne and held it for the next 17 years. In 549, Visigoth Athanagild sought military assistance from Justinian I of the Byzantine Empire, leading to the loss of Granada and southernmost Baetica to the representatives of the Byzantine Empire. These territories formed the province of Spania, established by the Byzantines, who intervened in Visigothic dynastic struggles and establishment established rather, a government at Cordoba, that's on the south coast of Spain. This intervention was part of a broader vision by Justinian for a kind of reconquest of the far west, a taking back of those lost Roman territories. Well, it never really came to light. But it was worth a try. The Visigothic kingdom underwent significant expansions and consolidation under its last Arian king, Louis Vigild. He conquered northern regions such as Cantabria in 574 and the Suevic kingdom in 584. Louis Vigild also regained parts of the southern areas lost to the Byzantines which were recovered by King Suintila in 624, with his reign lasting until 631. Now after Suintila, Wamba became the king of the Visigoths for eight years, between 672 to 680. During his reign, the Visigothic kingdom encompassed all of Hispania and part of southern Gaul known as Septimania. Wamba was then succeeded by King Ervig, whose rule lasted for seven years until 687. 
Erwig proclaimed Egger as his chosen successor on November the 14th, 687. In the year 700, Egger's son, Witteza, followed him to the throne, according to the Chronica Regum Visigothorum, an old source we have on Visigoth history. Well, of course, it couldn't all last forever. The Visigothic kingdom met its end in 711, when King Roderick, or Rodrigo, was killed opposing an invasion from the south by the Umayyad Caliphate in the Battle of Guadalet. This marked the beginning of the Umayyad conquest of Hispania, leading to Islamic rule over most of the Iberian Peninsula in the early 8th century. Well, the Visigoths left a significant legacy in the Iberian Peninsula, despite their relatively short reign. Following the fall of their kingdom to the Umayyad Caliphate, Visigothic nobles, such as Pelayo, played a crucial role in resisting Muslim rule. Pelayo's victory in the Battle of Covadonga in 718 led to the establishment of the Kingdom of Asturias in the northern part of the peninsula. At the end of Visigothic rule, the assimilation of Hispano-Romans and Visigoths was well underway, with remnants of the Hispano-Gothic aristocracy continuing to influence society. Some Visigoths fled, either to Septimania in southern Gaul or Asturias on the northern coast, where they supported Pelagius' uprising and formed a new aristocracy alongside the indigenous leaders. Others, who refused to adopt the Muslim faith or live under Muslim rule, simply sought refuge in the kingdom of the Franks, where they played significant roles in the empire of Charlemagne, and we will get to him later. Additionally, during the early years of the Emirate of Cordoba, a group of Visigoths remained under Muslim dominance, forming the personal bodyguard of the Emir. During their reign, the Visigoths founded several new cities in Spain, including Recopolis, Vitiaracum, modern-day Vittoria Castiez, Luceo and Olite. These cities were established for mainly military purposes and to commemorate victories. Now, despite their very long presence in Spain, there are very few remnants of the Gothic language found in Spanish, as the Visigoths intermarried with the Hispano-Roman population, and this led to the loss of their language over time. However, the Moors that ruled Spain afterwards from the Ayubid Caliphate, well, there are quite a few more of those references in Spanish. And... That's more of a linguistics video. Now, let's talk a little bit about the Visigothic culture. What was it like to be a part of the Visigoth realm? Did they have laws? Did they have art? Of course, they had all of this. And I'm going to briefly explain it over the next ten or so minutes. Now, before the Middle Ages, the Visigoths, like any other Germanic peoples, practiced Germanic paganism. But as they gradually converted to Christianity, many aspects of their pre-Christian culture persisted, particularly in the rural and distant regions. The Visigoths, along with the Ostrogoths and the Vandals, were Christianized while still outside the Roman Empire, 
but they adopted Arianism rather than the Nicene Christianities, which most of the Romans were following. This Arianism created a religious divide between the Visigoths who adhered to it and their Catholic subjects in Hispania. Deep sectarian splits among the Catholic population also contributed to the tolerance of Arians among the Visigoths. While the Visigoths did not interfere with the Catholics, they valued decorum and public order. King Leovigild attempted to bridge the religious gap by seeking a doctrinal compromise between the Visigothic Arian elite and the Hispano-Roman Nicene Catholic population. But unfortunately, his efforts to do this ended up in failure. It wasn't until Recaret I converted to Catholicism that significant changes would occur. Recaret sought to unify the kingdom under a single faith, leading to the conversion of many Visigoths from Arianism to Catholicism. Despite the conversion of the Visigothic elite, some elements of the Visigothic population maintained Arianism until the end of Leovigild's reign. Recaret's conversion marked the real significant shift towards Catholicism aiming to unify the entire kingdom under the same faith, a very difficult thing to do. But, once it was more or less achieved, it marked a significant religious transformation. And it really did manage to fix up the relationship issues between the Visigothic kingdom and the Catholic population of Hispania. During the Visigothic rule in Spain, while they adhered to Arianism, the Jewish community was generally well tolerated. Existing Roman and Byzantine laws influenced their status, although royal jurisdiction was limited, allowing local lords and populations to interact with Jews as they saw fit. Some Jews even held high-ranking positions in the government, the army, or were recruited for garrison service, indicating a level of respect and acceptance by the Visigothic kings. However, the situation changed when the Visigothic kings converted to Catholicism. King Recared convened the Third Council of Toledo to address religious disputes arising from the transition. Discriminatory laws were then passed at this council, and subsequent ones, leading to the forced conversion of Jews to Christianity. These laws were sometimes enforced with, let's just say, varying degrees of stringency. Oh, and by the way, when a Jew converted to Christianity, that wasn't just the end of it. They weren't a Christian, so to speak, or a Catholic, so to speak. They became something known as a converso. Basically, uh, a Jewish convert. You uh, always had that label of being a Jew in the Catholic territories. Well, under King Sisabet, a decree mandated the forced conversion of all Jews in Spain, leading to persecution, confiscation of property, ruinous taxes, the Jews wouldn't like that, and other hardships. Many Jews were compelled to convert publicly, but they continued to practice Judaism in the privacy of their own homes. The decree of 613 marked the beginning of a century of difficulty for Spanish Jewry, which persisted all the way until the Muslim conquest. 
The imposition of church power increased with the conversion of Visigothic kings to Catholicism, leading to the consolidation of bishops' authority. As Catholic conversion spread, the Visigoths began to become less distinguishable from the indigenous Roman citizens of the Iberian Peninsula. Culturally, they had effectively become exactly the same. The fall of the Visigothic strongholds to Muslim armies in the 8th century marked that end of the Visigothic rule in Spain, and all of a sudden turned it from a land of Catholics to a land of Muslims. The Gothic identity gradually faded away as Muslim invasions reshaped the societal landscape of Spain. Well, it's not all just about the religion. The Visigoths actually had quite formidable goldsmiths. They were great at making jewellery, fashioning fine jewels into different things. The treasure of Guarazal, discovered in Guadamar Toledo, is a significant collection of Visigothic metalwork found in Spain. It consisted of 26 votive crowns and golden crosses from the royal workshop in Toledo, displaying signs of Byzantine influence. This treasure is considered the pinnacle of Visigothic goldsmithery by Spanish archaeologists, and certainly the dream of many young Indiana Jones watching archaeologists who want to go out and find that buried treasure. Do imagine for a second when all you really find is arrowheads and maybe a few broken pieces of pottery. Well, all of a sudden coming across a giant pile of golden crowns. Well, this definitely makes the trip worthwhile. It belongs in a museum. Among the most notable items in the collection are the votive crowns of Recaswinth and Swintila, both made of gold and adorned with the most beautiful sapphires, pearls, and other precious stones. These crowns, along with other smaller crowns and votive crosses, are displayed in the National Archaeological Museum of Madrid, so if you're in Madrid, do go and see them. Some pieces from the collection were once actually owned by Queen Elizabeth II of Spain, including the crown of Swintila, which was unfortunately stolen in 1921. And to this day, at least at the time of making this video and to my best knowledge, has never been recovered. It's out there somewhere. We'll find it. Now, various institutions hold pieces from the treasure of Guazar. The National Archaeological Museum of Spain, the Royal Palace of Madrid, the National Museum of the Middle Ages in Paris. Well, the Paris one have three crowns, two crosses, links and gold pendants. But it seems the Spanish save the good stuff for themselves. Fair enough, it's their stuff. Well, it's not all just about the shiny gold pieces. What about the laws? They must have had something. Well, you see, unlike the Gauls and other barbarian tribes, quote-unquote, it wasn't just oral traditions. The Visigothic Code of Law also known as the Lex Visigothorum, was a significant legal document promulgated by King Chindasuinth between 642 and 653. It was initially part of an aristocratic oral tradition, but was written down very beautifully in 654 AD. Two separate codices of the code are preserved in El Escorial in Spain. 
One notable aspect of the Visigothic Code is its abolition of the previous practice of having separate laws for Romans and Visigoths. In our modern day sense, we call this extraterritoriality. For example, uh, if you go to another country and cause some trouble, the local police might want to deal with you differently than what you are used to. Go to some countries, the Middle East or Africa, you steal an apple or whatever else it is, you might end up getting your fingers cut off. Doesn't matter what passport you hold. You're subject to the laws of the land. This was one of the big disagreements they had with the colonization of Hong Kong before 1997, actually. That a lot of the British police, business people and travelers that would get caught up doing all sorts of nonsense in Hong Kong would be subject to British laws which were letting them off very, very easily. But that's a very different video. I do apologize, allow me to digress. Now, an important contribution of the Visigothic legal system, particularly in family law, was the protection of the property rights of married women. This provision ensured that married women retained ownership over their property, which was a significant departure from earlier Roman law. This protection of women's property rights persisted in Spanish law and influenced the development of the community property system that is prevalent in much of Western Europe to this very day. And with that, I think we've spoken enough about the Visigoths, at least for now. Now I'm currently working on another script about the sack of Rome in 410, which is indeed a topic in itself, from its actual occurrence to its aftermath and how the Romans reacted to this. So do look forward to that one. Before we go, I'd like to thank my Mega Chad tier patron, Stark Factory, for his contribution to keeping the channel going. And if you would like to keep the channel going, you can certainly do so by visiting the links to the Patreon. Otherwise, like, comment, subscribe, you know what to do. And look after each other. Good night, everyone. See you in the next video.